All right, hi everyone. Uh, while we uh, wait for folks to uh, tune in here, and thank you for everyone for sticking around for it starting a little late, but we'd rather have everybody here. So I'm gonna put up all the hashtags and handles for everyone associated with this, so that way you can screen capture it all and put to in it, and it also gives me a chance to uh, retweet this out because you know, of course we have to retweet it. Um, I'm sure. So. Uh, but yeah, thank you for everyone for coming around, sticking around for the uh, SciComm Monday live on location from Iagler 2017. As you can see, we are literally right on one of the uh, connecting waters between the Great Lakes here. So it really offers a really good location. And I'm kind of fat hoping that I actually got the IJC uh, building in the background. I was going to say there. It's one of them. It's one of them in there. No, it's the brown building. I think it's that one right there. So. Hi, IJC. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Allison, if you can hear us. <laughs> I had the joy of broadcasting from that location oh, uh, last year. Cool. So uh, with that, we're going to be talking about the uh, Social Great Lakes Symposium that's going to be tomorrow. So for any of you who are interested in SciComm, uh, definitely tune in for that. But we have one of the uh, co-chairs along with uh, yours truly Wait, here. Yeah, Nicole. Yeah. So hi uh, guys. Katie O'Reilly. So go ahead and tell a little bit about yourself. So. Yeah, well, hi guys. Um, I, we, Nicole and I were just reminiscing. We actually did a periscope at IAGLER last year. Um, a little less sophisticated of a setup. I think we did it yeah. from a stairwell. It would just be um, the phone hanging out like yeah. this as far as I possibly could. <laughs> but it was cool because that was actually kind of the birthplace of, you know, Social Great Lakes and where we came up with this kind of crazy idea to do some SciComm. Um, so it's it's nice to see it come full circle. And actually we've got like really great speakers talking about their SciComm um, and, you know, different ways of communicating some of the really cool Great Lakes science that's going to happen here this week. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting to go from having what felt like really not a lot going on yeah. last year to actually really having it robustly accepted this year. For those of you who just tuned in an hour ago, we had Jim Diana on uh, one of the co-chairs of IAGLER actually willingly you know, yeah. sitting down to a Periscope broadcast. He really enjoyed it. And it was a good time. So it's nice to be able to see a conference, an organization really embrace it yes exactly yeah I, we were talking it seems like you know there's a really cool atmosphere here that is conducive to doing SciComm and encouraging it so uh, we're looking forward to really you know sharing sharing the the cool Great Lakes science this week yeah it's it's gonna be exciting I mean there's gonna be uh, different uh, things going on so why don't you tell us a little bit about maybe kind of what yeah. you're gonna be talking about tomorrow kind of give everyone a little preview of oh, uh, yeah. what's to come so um, I don't want to give too much away, you know, oh, yeah, steal the thunder. Every, yeah, steal we're going to make you all watch it live of tomorrow. Course, but here's like to... your little like two minute, oh, like yeah. you're sitting in the theater preview to get you all yes, engaged. The, the, so. the, teaser, the teaser trailer. Yeah. Um, well, for me, I, if some of you who may follow me uh, may have seen in December, I did this crazy thing called 25 Days of Fishmas, <laughs> which was really just uh, the combination of my love of fish puns and Great Lake science. And so each day I featured a different fish um, species that's found in the Great Lakes and talked about both the ecology and kind of the, you know, science behind the fish species as well as their social impact um, uh, that, you know, some of the social, some of the uh, economic impacts and really kind of snowballed, which is a terrible winter pun, um, but it's snowballed. There's going to be a lot of puns here this week. There's gonna be, there already have started. It's really bad. It's, I apologize to everyone out there. Yeah, apologies in advance. There's going to yeah. be a lot of terrible dad and dad and pun humor this week. Um, but it snowballed into this kind of cool community effort uh, where a lot of different people from all, you know, different walks of life were contributing, uh, sharing their experiences with the Great Lakes and with different fish species. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about how SciCon can be um, a tool to engage people, not just in scientific understanding, but in producing these personal responses to science, which is really a key, key thing. Yeah, so definitely tune in. As uh, Illinois uh, Indiana Sea Grant said, yes, it was indeed awesome. So I'm it's definitely a talk that I'm looking forward to. So and it really goes to show you like how you can just take a simple concept and really reach a lot of people out there uh, with your science uh, through SciComm. Yeah. So. And Nicole, what about you? I know you're giving a talk tomorrow. I'm talking about this. So. <laughs> 
Yeah, so everything with uh, Periscope, Facebook Live, all about doing the live streaming, so getting your science out there to an audience of where they can engage back with you uh, through a live on video like this is pretty much what it's going to be. So I'm going to yeah. give you a little preview of what the uh, programs are, the platforms that you can use, uh, different ways that you can use it to help uh, highlight your science, and then also show you some of the equipment that I use for things, so that way you can see the craziness of cables that has to happen to make this happen, so. But there's no better person to give it. I mean, you are the, like, live streaming SciComm gu guru, so. Somehow, yeah, I've <laughs> kind of fallen into that now, so. But, uh, yeah, so definitely tune in for that. There's gonna be a lot of other great talks. We're gonna have a couple of the uh, other speakers on to uh, preview uh, their talks, which will be exciting, because I'm glad I was actually able to talk them into coming to IAGLER, because this is their first time here, so I'm excited to yeah. uh, have them here. So and that's the really good thing about uh, SciComm that I really like is it gets people from all these yeah. different disciplines to come in and share uh, their work and how they do their SciComm and reach out to people. Yeah, so. and we have people who like may not be specifically Great Lakes focused even, but sharing mm -hmm. it, kind of the universal uh, lessons of SciComm, which is cool. Because um, a lot of things I think can transfer from between disciplines, can transfer between, um, you know, systems being Great Lakes or wherever you do your science. So for anyone out there who has any questions for uh, Katie about uh, SciComm, about Social Great Lakes, the uh, symposium tomorrow, definitely feel free to uh, send them in. We don't want to just be talking at you. Uh, feel free to uh, ask away any questions you have. So um, I want to take a little side note here. You know, all of us are SciCommers, but we're also um, uh, we're scientists first, many of us. So can you tell us a little bit about what science it is yeah. that you do? Of course. Um, so I'm actually a grad student at the University of Notre Dame, and my focus is on um, kind of the coastal wetlands around the Great Lakes. So I look at how fish use the wetlands throughout their life and how they might take some of the energy that's in these really productive habitats and move it between uh, like the lake itself and the wetland and kind of that transfer of energy and nutrients. Um, I always joke it's an excuse for me to get out on a boat and catch fish all day, but I do really... Oh, woe know. is us with that Oh, job. darn. <laughs> but it, for every, you know, nice day that's sunny and beautiful, like, behind us, you know, you have There's the days of, when you're in the waiters and you got your winter coat, but it's still the but first part just, of September. You're like, it's summer. You're I like, this should, be, this should be a lot warmer and a lot more yeah. enjoyable. But so, um, yeah, I, I really enjoy it. And most of my work focuses on fish, but I kind of look at whole ecosystems too, which is which is fun. Um, so what are some of the issues that you see with the coastal wetlands of Michigan? Are they yeah. getting better? Are they getting worse? Like when you're, when you're out there, what is it that you see? That's actually a really good question because I'm involved in this big kind of multi-institution project, which is coastal wetland monitoring. And we go across the entire basin uh, basically on a yearly basis, going to certain sites and um, doing basically the same kind of sampling at each site as a way of setting like baselines and seeing what's there. Um, and so this has actually been going on since 2011. Um, and it's nice because we're getting a kind of long-term data set about the health of these wetlands. And um, it's important because a lot of these, I mean, I, one of the scary stats is that 50% of the wetlands that it used to exist in, you know, the Great Lakes uh, are basically gone. That, that were there previous, like, to European settlement have been basically filled in or converted to other right. land use. Yeah, it's, uh, when I had uh, Charles B. Van Rees on, what, a month or two ago, and he does work in Hawaii with their wetlands there, and the figure that he showed pre-settlement to now of their wetlands, it just made you go, you're just like, oh, oh wow. my god. <laughs> It's like, there's nothing there. Yeah, and uh, then the rest of the wetlands that are here face, you know, the same issues that a lot of just the Great Lakes face in general, invasive species, um, fr habitat fragmentation. And so uh, by monitoring these wetlands, we can kind of see how the health is doing and, uh, you know, focus our efforts on restoration and uh, kind of preserving what we have left. Yeah, and... You know, speaking of preserving what we have left, a lot of us got a really big scare this year of possibly having our funding cut. If, if your funding was cut, like if that big, you know, $300 million GLI grant got yeah. slashed down to $10 million, how do you think that would impact you and your work? It would definitely impact me. Um, I mean, a lot of our work, or a lot of our uh, 
funding does come from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. That's what funds this big institutional uh, kind of project. And I, I mean, it would be really difficult to go and maintain uh, kind of our sampling regime. It involves a lot of travel. We sampled, I believe it's like, it's eight, 800 to 1,000 wetlands. Yeah, because I think like per year, or like our lab has yeah. done like 50 to 60 wetlands every year. Yeah. And of course, you know, it's been since 2011. Right. Uh, my lab does the uh, bird and amphibian section of this huge study. And it is, it's a lot of travel. It's a lot of wetlands. And, yeah, and you need and a lot of people power. Yeah. yeah, if you don't have that money, you just, I mean, we would love to go out there and, and do it as much as we can, but there are logistical limits. limitations right. and limits to what you can do. Yeah, and without that data set, how can we inform the public what it is that they need to do to be able to make the yeah. Great Lakes healthy or maintain their health? Like, yeah, don't yeah. Have that data set there. And it, it's so. definitely, it's not just the, the public that can know what they can do. A lot of the data that we collect as part of this project uh, is used by managers. So people who are managing the land, um, they really rely on that those data to make decisions about you know where am I going to focus my efforts on restoring um, or where am I going to you know focus my efforts on preserving mm -hmm. so speaking of like having our funding cut and things like that and bringing it back to SciCom yeah. how important is it for us to be able to reach out and talk to people about this so that way they know the issues that face the Great Lake and you know how do you use yeah. something like science communication to be able to reach out to people Absolutely. I mean, that was one of, I think, the things that 25 Days of Fishmas um, did really well was talking about, um, you know, the emotional and kind of personal connection to the Great Lakes and how things have changed over time. I know one day we talked about, like, alewives, which are an invasive species in the Great Lakes, and um, we talked about some of the, some of, like, the uh, impacts that they had, such as big piles of fish ending up on Great Lakes beaches and kind of tying that into these issues that have been mitigated over the years because of the increased funding towards research um, and increased funding towards management and you know these are things that may not uh, that might need to be continued um, if we want to keep moving forward in making the Great Lakes great again. Great, yes. Um, so we had a question come in. How do you uh, how do you reach out to the public? You know, is it just through Twitter, or do you do other ways of trying to uh, reach the public and get them engaged with what is going on with the Great Lakes? That's a great question. I do a lot of my own personal outreach through through Twitter, but I also do some kind of lo like local events. Um, Notre Dame does this kind of Science Sunday thing where we bring in. Uh, you know, or we invite the public to the local parks and we talk about different environmental issues. Uh, last fall I was talking about microplastics in kind of, you know, ecological systems. And we made a, a cool game where kids could pretend to be filter feeders. Ooh, I'm always game for games. Oh, so. game, games are yeah. awesome. Um, we basically had a big fish tank filled with water and zooplankton, uh, which were little paper cutouts and we had thrown in some plastics as well. So basically the, the kids were acting like they were a filter feeder like a clam, trying to get those zooplankton, but at the same time, because they were using like a little net, they couldn't just get the zooplankton, they also caught, um, like, they, they caught the plastic. And so that kind of illustrated to them that, you know, if you're filtering a lot of water, you might grab or pull in things that you don't want, like plastic debris. Okay. Yeah, I, I like those kind of hands-on activities so that, like, um, you can really get people engaged with it. Because I always yeah. find, like, the more hands-on you get, the more it just resonates. At least that's no, me. Yeah. Like, I find, like, I learn better when I'm actively uh, doing something. Yeah, you're um, kind of engaged in that sense. You're not just passively absorbing information. Right. Yeah, especially for the kids out there. If you can really get them involved with something, it really sticks home. And it's amazing how much they remember. Like, I've got oh, a nine-year-old yeah. nephew and a... Uh, seven-year-old niece and the amount of information that they remember from my research and other things because you know I've, I've actually literally had my nephew helping me sort SAB or oh, submerged aquatic awesome. vegetation that like it was real stuff I used for my thesis and Aww. he remembers all that and he like some of it I almost wonder if he knows it better than me because he <laughs> can retain it that well and so like if you can make that hands-on stuff yeah. like, it's amazing what they do well and that you bring up a good point Nicole is you know 
why why did any of us get interested in science and I know for me it's like as a kid I got to go play in the streams and um, you know my parents encouraged me to like read science books and stuff and so I think if you make that kind of personal connection at a young age you're more likely to want to get engaged in some sense whether or not that means becoming a, a scientist or doing just being interested in science I think making that connection um, early in life is is really important yeah so uh, we have a, another common question most have little to think about the uh, environment so small things do help so yeah those little things like I was just uh, watching uh, on the news the other day about kids from downtown Grand Rapids who had never been to Lake Michigan before and they were able, there was a special trip that a dozen of them were able to go out for the first time yeah. to see Lake Michigan. I was just like, you live, what, 30, 40 so miles close. away from the lake and you've never been there. And these were, I, I can't remember if they were like middle school students, I believe there was middle school students. And it was just like, it was so sad that they had never been there. But yeah. by exposing them to that, they're like, more likely to be able to get engaged in and care about it and be wanting to be there, you know, whether or not they eventually become scientists yeah. or not, that they are going to be supportive of scientists and supportive of the work that we do to be able to help protect the Great Lakes. Right. I think sometimes, I mean, I know we, I often, I mean, sometimes I take the Great Lakes for granted. It's like, you know, they're in our backyard. Um, they're just kind of there sometimes. But when you really think about it, having such a large freshwater system, these freshwater seas basically is really really unique and really a great asset to this part of the country um, that definitely I think in the past has maybe been a little abused uh, to put it lightly right. but I think we're making strides to to bring them back yes for sure so I we're gonna try to keep yeah, things moving on we're gonna like awkwardly switch things <laughs> and hopefully get everyone mic'd up but we figured it was better to be able to do this all uh, through one stream rather than starting a second stream so as soon as I can get a couple of these uh, other folks over here to get up over here and get mic'd uh, we'll continue on but I definitely uh, want to thank Katie for uh, joining us and tune in tomorrow because we'll be uh, broadcasting all the talks from Social Street Great Lakes so you can uh, catch your talk about 25 days of uh, yeah. fish miss and see all the uh, fun and I uh, is there a grumpy uh, burbot? Oh, might, uh, grumpy burbot totally yeah, makes a cameo. Might, okay. There's actually there's a there's a lot of Twitter cameos, and you know you might want to pull up like a, a cup of hot chocolate, <laughs> get in the holiday spirit. There might be when it's 80 degrees. When it's outward. 80 degrees outside, yeah. Although it is pretty cool in here, you probably could get away with exactly, it. Exactly. So, yeah. You know. Yeah, we'll, we'll get in the we'll get in the holiday spirit and take you back to 25 days of fish miss tomorrow. But there's going to be a, a lot of other cool talks that you should definitely tune in for as well. Great. Yep, so we're going to get uh, Jordan and Ariel over we'll here. We'll do some awkward uh, mic switching. We can switching. get them away right. from uh, the conversation that they already started because they're, they're side combing you know, without They started side combing yeah. yeah. I mean, really? Come on. Get over here. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, give us just a second to get things switched around, and we'll uh, continue with the second half of this. So. Can I get Thanks. the microphone? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. No pressure. No pressure. That way you can't get away. <laughs> Alright, we're gonna awkwardly have to cull together. I think that's good. Well, I clearly don't like either of you. So. No, not so at all. Really, to you. Really yeah. <laughs> so I want to uh, thank these two lovely gals for showing up to IAGLER because they are not Great Lakes scientists, but they are amazing sci-commers. So I will let you guys introduce yourselves out to uh, the Periscope world out there, please. So, hey everybody, um, my name is Ariel Fernier. Um, I'm currently a postdoc down at Mississippi State, um, but if you follow me on Twitter, you probably know about my project Mo Rails. So I, I spend a lot of time working in wetlands and studying bird migration. Um, my name is Jordan Rudder, and I actually did my master's recently in the Great Lakes, so I do have a connection, luckily. Um, I studied the Great Lakes population of piping plovers. Um, <laughs> that's where I am with like this part. Like, if I'm already forgetting that with like this day, that is so bad. Um, it's because you're in Minnesota, I completely forgot. <laughs> um, but so I actually did a human dimensions project with them, and you can learn more at hashtag GLPIPL, G L P I P L. Um, but currently, I am actually the communications person for the American Ornithological Society, or at Am Ornith on Twitter. So it's because you've never been to Iagler. That's the thing that keeps throwing me off. <laughs> 
So uh, these two wonderful sidecomers are going to be uh, presenting tomorrow with their uh, work um, with MoRails and with uh, AOS slash NAOC. Uh, so why don't you give us maybe just a little preview of what people can look forward to tomorrow. Um, so tomorrow most of what I'm going to be talking about is kind of using my my experience kind of tweeting about my doctoral research is kind of a case study for how you can use Twitter and just to a tiny extent Periscope to kind of share field research live in the field and different strategies for doing that, how to do it effectively, um, just kind of things like that. So lots lots of rail pictures and pictures of mud and ATVs and reflections on those topics. So. <laughs> it should be fun. Yeah. And I'm going to be talking about NAOC 2016, which stands for the North American Ornithological Conference, which happened last year in August in Washington, D.C. I actually was the person behind the social media for that conference, and we'll be using that as a case study to talk about why social media and scientific conferences are a match made in digital heaven. <laughs> um, I personally and others do agree that um, social media is a way for us to get the science at these conferences outside of the walls of, say, the conference center and actually be able to share what this cutting-edge research is with people that aren't here in, um, in person. So, yeah. So, for uh, those of you out there who are currently getting to enjoy uh, part of IAGLER by not even being here, this is a really good format to be able to do that. Um, what are some other different ways that you guys have seen people engage with conferences? Uh, when they're not actually able to be at the conference themselves that you found effective. You mean via social media yeah. or? Mm -hmm. um, well, so Ariel and I actually were at the Wilson Society conference um, in March in Florida and there were people that were tweeting um, that they wanted people to tweet more because they weren't there in person and so they had questions that they either wanted us to ask in person for them on their behalf um, or they just wanted to hear more about the talks. Um, usually the programs are put on a website and so that allows people that aren't in attendance to be able to see which would then allow them to say you know I'm really interested in this topic like tell me more. Um, I know Vultures of DC actually was a bird account that asked for more bird questions to be asked at this bird conference. Um, <laughs> so that was really fun. So I think that's really effective and I mean, one of the things that's been really interesting to me is, as someone who's been trying to be at a conference and use Twitter to expand that reach, I found that I stay in one symposium more to kind of help give the people that are reading my tweets that broader context, um, which has been really interesting as well, and it's kind of changed how I go to conferences, too, so yeah. that's been cool. It's also been a really nice way to, even if you are in person at the conference, to be able to keep track of the symposiums or talks that you can't go to because you can't be in multiple places at once. So um, I personally have tag teamed with other people, including Ariel or Nicole, to say, you know, we're going to split up and then be able to have notes essentially on Twitter that we can go back to and reference um, when reviewing all of those talks that we went to. And so that's been a really cool way. And I think, um, and this I'll talk more about in my talk tomorrow, but um, Twitter is really made for conferences just because you have the ability to post so frequently and so much um, compared to, say, Facebook. Um, and so I'll talk about some of those differences tomorrow. Yeah, I definitely find Facebook is one like where you only want to post maybe once or twice a day if you're overloading people and yeah. just get really bogged down, especially if you're uh, running, say, like your own page versus a profile where folks are getting those notifications. It's yeah. nice, yeah. like with Twitter, you can kind of tune it out until you want to be able to go engage back in it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and there's the hashtag too, which allows you then to see all of the posts collated together. So it's not just your post, but it's everyone. Um, where in Facebook, that's a lot more challenging. So. Uh, when you're live tweeting a talk, what are some like tips and tricks that you have for when you're actually out there doing it that you have found have been successful? Thread things together. So like start with like the title and if you can the person's name and then string everything together from there. That way folks can kind of follow and get a little bit more of the context. Because one one tweet from a talk without the bigger context can be really confusing sometimes. <laughs> yep. Um, two other things, and this is this is really highlighting my talk tomorrow, so you're getting a good, <laughs> good little preview. Um, make sure you include the hashtag because it's great for you to be posting at a conference, but your actual level of engagement and exposure will 
greatly decrease if you don't use that hashtag. Um, and then the other thing is try to remember that it's okay to post a lot. So don't put too much information into one tweet, right? You want to be clear and concise because it is the internet. You don't want to be convoluted or misconstrued. And so it's okay to post 50 times instead of try to put an entire talk summarized into one tweet. Um, so just, again, going back to that thread, utilize that. Yeah, I really like the mention of the hashtag because I, I know the side party, which you're a moderator of, if you aren't putting that hashtag in there, I won't see that because I just search the hashtag and keep refreshing that particular search to be able to see what people are posting. And I assume a lot of people do the same thing when it comes to conferences as Definitely. well. Definitely. So, so what are some of the things that you guys are looking forward to since this is your first trip to Iagler? I've actually been to Iagler before. What? I don't what? think you realize what? 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 before my time. How am I supposed to know that? <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm really excited to just, you know, to be exposed to, like, a different scientific community and get to absorb some good stuff, and also just to be back in the Great Lakes. I mean, I've, you know, I grew up in Ohio, and it's, it's good to be back. So, but yeah. I've been here before. This is old. old. <sighs> I'm just going to end between, like, forgetting that, like, Jordan's research was here in the Great Lakes, of which, you know, I actually helped her, like, process some of her research, and then that you've actually been here. I'm just going to turn in my badge. Well, we're done. Post the conference over. Yes. Yeah. It's all canceled. <laughs> so, I don't know. Jordan, what are you looking forward to? Since this is, this is your first time, yes, right? This, this is my, for sure, 100%. Like, I'm double checking. Yes, this is my first day at their conference, and um, I... I Totally legit, but I feel like the cop-out answer would be the exposure to all of the non-bird science, um, since I am a bird person. Um, there so are some I... burgers here. <coughs> no, 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 I know, but okay. I'm just saying right. that, that this is a different <laughs> tax than even yeah. other scientific um, uh, studies that I'm not as familiar with. Um, so I am going to actually final answer, say, the fish versus bird puns. Ooh. That are going to be happening Ooh. over the, the fish next person over here. See that it's a big <laughs> challenge. You can get my fish on this. Yes. <laughs> so it seems um, like fighting words. Joe. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want you to know that I totally just winged that answer. Oh. So, <laughs> we'll try not to get too sore. Oh. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we're, we're lucky Solomon's not here. Otherwise, this would be so bad. So. Yeah. The car, the gar ponds that are going to be happening are yeah. just going to be horrendous. So it's going to be great. Yeah. Really. yeah, a whole week of this. You have a whole week of this. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna be great. Yeah. yeah. So, um, what are some other just general things when you guys see SciComm out there that like would be beneficial for people here at the conference to partake in now? Yeah. Um, so for folks who are actually here attending the meeting, right? Um, I mean, I think you can also use Twitter as a way to find a smaller community within a conference. Um, so if you see somebody on Twitter tweeting, see if they will, you know, grab coffee with you, or if you can meet up with them at a reception or something, and kind of make a connection. Even if you don't talk for very long, it can be a really great way of, of finding a smaller community within a conference and meeting people that you probably wouldn't have run into otherwise. Yeah. And then this is kind of an overarching comment, um, but also addresses the question directly, is that social media is a tool, and so you want to take advantage of this tool. It's not supposed to replace those in-person interactions, because there will never be anything that beats those, um, but in order to have even more meaningful networking opportunities or more meaningful interactions, you can use social media to, again, either document the conference in the form of note-taking or to set up said coffee dates. So it really is just something that... Um, you kind of will get what you put into it. And so if you want to just be an observer, whether that's on social media or in person, that's great. But if you actually want to put a little bit more investment into it, you can, again, make friendships or meet people um, that can, again, go beyond the walls of the conference, whether that's right now in this moment or even beyond the time of the conference. Yeah, I know myself personally, when I've engaged with someone on Twitter and then actually met them in real life, it's made that transition so much easier. You're you're so much more at ease with that person than what you are if you're just like, first of all, like, hi, I'm Nicole, it's nice to meet you. I can't imagine like, you ever yeah. actually introducing yourself. That <laughs> no, I totally would. <laughs> well, it's funny you but, bring that up, Nicole, because yeah. like, when I was down at the registration table, um, you know, I said my name to get my, my registration materials, and they're just like, 
oh, I recognize you from Twitter, and then, like, it led into an introduction, and so that was super cool. Sure, to, like, yeah. you know, it was a natural way to be like, oh, I, I know your name. And, yeah. Right, and, and even if you didn't know someone ahead of time at the conference, I've had people where they've followed my tweets during the conference, and I've met them towards the end of the conference, and it's eased that transition right there. Like, at NAOC last year, uh, Charles B. Van Rees, like, came up to me, and he, looked at my name badge and all of a sudden his eyes got really wide. He's like, you're wildlife file gal. And it just started this huge fun conversation that's continued. Like I've even had him on Snycom Monday because of that interaction because he was engaged with Twitter. And Oops. so it's, yeah. Plus it, he does rail work, which is just like a great quality <laughs> yes. person. So. Well, <laughs> I will, I will say this too. It's a lot easier to stay in touch with people on social media. Um, at least I personally find than when you have to email them and that's either because you can kind of like check in on what they're posting at any time of the day without them really knowing um, you're stalking or, them online just a minute without having to bother them is probably a better way to put it yeah. it's a little less you're checking in on them without making them yes give right. but I well my segue was going to be <laughs> that um Sometimes, you know, when you want to reach out to someone that you really look up to or think they're doing really cool science, emailing can sometimes seem a little... Um, it can be intimidating. Yes, it can be intimidating. It can seem it's like an so, obstacle. It's for, so formalized, yes, too. I feel exactly. like social media is so Do much you, more just casual. Yep, and, and so um, I think that there is this kind of element of having a very welcoming... Um, persona on social media and so if you tweet at someone a question or just want to connect um, after the conference that's okay and it's, it's nice to be able to um yeah sorry I'm distracted no no you're good I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> no but it really does like I mean the community that you have with SciCommerce is really I mean look at us here I mean we all got to know each other because of social media and it's led to some really good friendships and things that carry on like past just social media like it's a good support system like I know any time of day I can get a hold of any of these gals and they're gonna like have some good answers to help me like get through whatever even if it's my science if it's you know something personal of life as a scientist it's life in general <laughs> right yeah I mean it's really good and everyone's always so welcoming I think that's just because when you're a communicator, you just tend you want to be out there and helping folks and helping them learn, and it translates into your daily life with how you interact with people. It's really amazing for students to get that outside community. Yeah. Yeah. And students of any age or level. Oh, yeah. yeah, most definitely. So yeah. just yeah, I mean, if you're undergrad, if you're a freshman, start psychobby now. It will help you so much when it's time for you to try to get a grad school position or beyond. I mean. It gets you that network of people that will know who you are, and so when you are sending off your CV, they're like, oh, "I already know who you are. We're good." Yeah. Well. Great. Uh, Especially now that um, whether it's graduate school or, or any school or even jobs, they'll Google you. They they will <laughs> they will check up on your social media accounts. So having that digital presence is not only beneficial, but you know, doing it in a way that really is promoting what you're values and what you're about um, will actually benefit you in the long run as well. Yeah, and there's the benefit of sometimes PIs will post opportunities on Facebook, or not, not Facebook, on Twitter, um, maybe Facebook too, I'm just not as familiar with that, but yeah. they can share opportunities that you may have missed um, through other tradi like traditional means. Like job boards. Uh, job like boards right. and conferences. Um, so that's yeah. kind, of, kind of cool that you can have those opportunities right at your fingertips. Yeah. And it can, again, give you kind of a, a less formal way of kind of reaching out and right. being like, oh, I have a question about this position, and kind of getting that feedback. So, yeah, it yeah, really absolutely. good. Yeah. So, any last-minute uh, comments, suggestions, or things for everyone out there before we get off? And well, anybody who's at iAngler, you, you should definitely come by and say hi to everybody. Don't yeah. be afraid to, to say hi and introduce yourself. And, yeah, and see you on Twitter. Yeah. Definitely don't hesitate to reach out on Twitter and ask us questions or just say hi or anything like that. So, yeah, and speaking of reach out for Twitter, I'll throw up everyone's handles so you guys can all have it if you want to take a screenshot. So the hashtag for the conference is Iagler2017. Uh, obviously, you can always reach me at SciCon Monday or at my personal handle, Wildlife Bio Gal. You can reach all of these gals at their different handles. So go Do ahead. Dr. Catfish is me. Uh, Raleigh Rule. J.E. Rudder. 
Yeah. And then the hashtag for the uh, symposium is Social Great Lakes, so definitely uh, follow that hashtag along throughout the conference and especially tomorrow during the symposium, which is from 1.20 to 5.20 uh, p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, and we will be broadcasting that live on Periscope, so tune in to see all of this great uh, SciComm that will be coming to you live. So with that, I hope you guys all had a good time. Thank you for so much for coming in, yeah. and thank you to everyone for being patient with a couple of late stragglers, yeah. Sure, <laughs> we've been to a Agler before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, all right, we'll see you guys all tomorrow or any other time to uh, uh, hopefully get things out for everyone. So, Thanks, see guys. you all later. Bye.